Good night, Chess Gold Team. Boa noite, equipe Cabra Xadrez. Hoje eu vou falar sobre o nosso Mequinho e eu resolvi fazer o vídeo em inglês que é para divulgar o nosso grande campeão no, no mundo. So, today I will be speaking in English because I want to show you guys a, a game from Henrique Mekin, the Brazilian champion and... Uh, He was the third strongest guy in the world in the 60s. So very, very good player. Uh, from this chess games biography, I will read here with you. Henrique da Costa Mekin was born in Santa Cruz do Sul. He learned chess at the age of six. He won his state championship at the age of 11 in 1965. When just 13 years old, he won his country's championship, 2.5 points more than second place. For this victory, many chess critics hailed him as the next Fischer, uh, referring to the fact that Robert Fischer had won the U.S. championship at 14. Mackin also won the Brazil championship in 65, 67, never played another championship except for the 2011 edition. Uh, he he was uh, away from the board for many years because of a, a disease. Um, in 1966, he was South American champion with uh, jointly with Julio Bobo Chan, Oscar Pano, Alberto Fogelman. He played in the South International Inter Interzonal in six seven and at the age of 15 and won the Sosi Speed Championship. Mackin was awarded the title of International Grand Master in 71 at the age of 19 after winning Rissac and taking third at Hastings, South American Championship champion at Sao Paulo, 2.5 points ahead of Oscar Pano and Miguel Quinteros. Uh, he won the two interzonal events in Petrópolis without any loss in Manila and Terzono in 76, only losing to Spassky. This and other tournament victors voted him to third place on FIDS World Rankings list in 77, behind only uh, world champion Anatoly Karpov at the time and Victor Kortinoy. So he was third in the world in 77. In 79, Mackin was attempting his third consecutive inter interzonal victor when he was forced to withdraw from the tournament, having been stricken with a near fatal illness, Miastenia Gravis. It took 12 years for him to recover enough to resume his chess career. So he was away from board for 12 years. He still lives in Brazil and maintains a high rating. Not as high as he used to to get to be, but it's still top player here. <laughs> Although he has not managed to rejoin the world's elite. By 2009, Mackin was Brazil's 50th uh, highest hated player. He took on the 10, the then Brazilian number one, o Takeda dos Ufier, in a match of four classical games in Sao Paulo. Uh, Brazil 2030 and 27th in September 2009. The match was draw uh, to all, to to all, to each. <laughs> so, and this is a little bit of the story of Mackin. I believe we have a picture of him here. Let me show his funny picture. Where is it? Uh, yes, so uh, an old picture, and we are going to see a game of this guy. So let's see what game I chose. Ah, and here is the site Buy Me a Coffee. You can go there to donate if you like. So I chose a game uh, where Mackin is playing black. I will invert the board. And Bent Larsen is playing white. Bent Larsen was one of the high-hated hated American chess players 
he was disputing with Fischer at the time to to see who will who would be the, the world champion who, who would go to the candidates and he was beaten by Fischer six to zero huh. but he was very strong and Mackin uh, played him in this tournament Palma de Mallorca so let's see the game so Bent Larsen started with G3 and he refused to <clears throat> Huh. There are many cursors in the screen. I'm not sure if you can see a lot of cursors. <clears throat> well, where was I? Ah, yes. Uh, he, he refused to go to the center right away. And Mackin also tried uh, a fianche to bishop. So it starts a Hungarian opening, a symmetrical variation. So both bishops in fianchetto, knight c3, c5. Then Mackin goes for the center. d3, knight c6. And this knight f3 is not played too much. And the answer by Mackin uh, was not in any database here, in, at Liches at least. So after e6, we have a new game never played, uh, played after. This position never reached after. So there we go. A castle and d5. Making goals for the center and he will uh, create the, use the principle of two weaknesses. Let's see how this goes. a3, knight g7, keeping developing. Rook b1, castle. Bishop d2, rook b8, so the fight for the b column. White wants to open the b file. And b4, that it is. And c takes b4. a takes b4, and b5 fixing that pawn. So if you pay attention, both knights are attacking the fixed pawns. But it is black who has the chance to have uh, passed the pawn here if the game went to an end game <clears throat> and now uh, larsen went for e4 to attack in the center but uh, making media zutzen zung move that means uh, in between move and attacked with a5. He takes d, and instead of taking back, because if he takes back, well, white takes a5, and this pawn uh, is not a passed pawn. So here we see this in-between move. Knights take b4. This will change the characteristic of the game. d takes e6, and bishop takes e6. Now what we have here is that instead of changing, exchanging these pawns here, uh, black decide to exchange here. And it has two beautiful pawns on the queen side that can be decisive. Knight g5 attacking the bishop. Bishop d5 trying to centralize the piece and if White takes, while well, black takes with the knight, and all is well. So knight g to e4 going back, and bishop c6. Since black uh, white didn't took the bishop, black decided to keep the bishop pair. Knight e2. And now f5. Now see what Mackin is doing. Uh, strategically speaking, he has this... Uh, advantage in his space in the queen side, but he's not playing in the queen side. He decides to attack in the king side. Uh, why? Because he has more space and he can coordinate in, in the both sides of the board uh, easily. And white will not be able to defend the queen, the queen side and the king side at the same time. 
So that's the strategy here in this game. Knight g5 and exchange of these light square bishops. White light square bishop was very strong, so we have no more light square bishops for any players. Knight e to c6, h4. Um, it looks like a possible attack, but it's not. It's actually uh, trying to get some space in the king's side. Uh, white want to attack here. It, it has some potential, but uh, as we are going to see, uh, it, they they don't have the time. So h6, uh, forcing the knight back, knight f3. King h7, defending the pawn, bishop c3, and we exchange the other bishop. So it's a knight's fight. Knight d4, knight takes d4, queen takes d4, and now uh, if you look at the position, you see how, how black is in a huge advantage of space. The queen is centralized, the knight is very well placed, the rooks are doing some job. And while white has a, a, a bad rook and the queen is doing nothing, it cannot go anywhere near the black king. So uh, black, black is winning here. Also, you can check this bar. If it goes up for black, it's black is winning. If it go down for white, it's white winning. And the graph. The graph until now is a little bit equal it will happen something here that we will see so knight e2 queen c5 and rook the rook if uh, b2 now knight d5 and this pawn is ready to be pushed a little bit further so blacks will uh, strike in the king side and open the king's position, the white king's position. Now, rook e1, this is a mistake. So what white should be doing here is play c, c4 and try to eliminate this problem, the queen side that uh, is taken by black. And then he can move his army to the king side but the way it is trying to uh, dominate the center here without having a queen side and being uh, being attacked in the king side will not work so f4 there there you go the the king the white king is about to be exposed G takes f4, knight takes f4, check. Knight takes f4, hook takes f4. Now, you need to pay attention in the pressure at the f2 pawn. There are two attacks on it, and this pawn is weak. We have an uh, open file here, so the attack is going very well. Queen e2 trying to defend, but that's no good. Uh, so, if you would like to pause the video here, oh, I forgot to turn off the arrow. You don't see the arrows. If you'd like to turn turn the, the the pause the video here, you can check uh, and try to find the move that making missed. That is instant instant death for white. Okay. Oh. Okay, so uh, Mackin didn't play this move, but it is hook to e8, giving uh, this hook as a sacrifice. Because if it takes, queen takes f2, and there is no defense against mate here. So that's very beautiful. But Mackin didn't see this one, and he chose another plan that's also in. He played queen d5. Now the defense was not perfect, but there is no salvation anymore. 
f3, rook from b f8, rook f1 trying to defend this pawn again, but this is no good. Uh, b4 preventing white to expand the king in the queen side. Now the game will really move to the king side. Rook b b1, rook from eight f7, defending any infiltration of the white king queen to the f7 f7 f to the seventh hank. Rook from b e1, and now rook takes h4. The white king is being is feeling the breeze. Queen e5, queen c6, and then rook f2, rook g4, check. Here you cannot take the rook because the pawn is pinned. So the king must go away from the defense of the f2 pawn. King h1 and rook takes f3. Queen e7, check, and simply going back with the rook uh, the defense is just to cover the the king you attack the queen and you also give a discovered check so there is no time to take the the, the rook here uh, white still played a, a little bit more king h2 rook takes e7 rook takes e7 and king g8 and that's the end of it and at in this position, uh, black uh, white resigned. I don't know why we have two, three. We have a lot of mouse cursors here. I need to understand what's happening in my screen. <laughs> but uh, I hope this was a nice game. And did you enjoy? If you like, if you like, check out Enrique Mackin. Uh, from chessgames.com, uh, this database, and find more games from him, I'm sure you will be amazed how well he played. So thank you very much, and I see you at the next time. Bye-bye.